sale water bottles there's a survival kit um, and of course books are available for sale just at that tin over there and the authors will go for about 30 minutes after each session to sign books in the book signing tent um, there's food available for sale from the orange peel bakery mary's lemonade which is delicious the scottish bakehouse chef dion catering and chef amy's amy johnson's food truck and please support those food vendors. Um, we will have a, a brief period for questions and answers at the end of the talk. There's a microphone over there. Please line up behind it. And um, I, it is my pleasure, I'm trying to go fast so we can get to the speaker, uh, my pleasure to introduce Alexandra Styron. She is the author of the memoir, Yay. <laughs> Reading My Father, the novel, all the Finest Girls, and a new book, Steal This Country, a handbook for resistance, persistence, and fixing almost any, everything, anything under the sun. <laughs> a timely call for citizen activism. She teaches memoir writing in the MFA program at Hunter College, and Al is also a member of the Martha's Vineyard Book Festival Advisory Board. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. It is my total pleasure to introduce you to Tatiana Schlossberg. I'm going to begin with her bio. Tatiana Schlossberg, former New York Times science writer, is a journalist who covers climate change and the environment. Her work has also appeared in The Atlantic, Bloomberg View, Yale Environment 360, and, Vi and the Vineyard Gazette. She attended Yale University and received a master's degree in American history from the University of Oxford. Inconspicuous Consumption, her first book, explores how climate change and environmental pollution are entangled in everything we use, buy, eat, wear, and how we get around. Now, on a much more personal note, because this is home turf, and I promise you this will not happen to you anywhere else on your book tour, I've known Tatiana since the day she was born. <laughs> I remember where I was when your father woke me up to tell me that you were born. Uh, and I'm proud to say that I taught her how to eat ice cream for breakfast. <laughs> but this is what she's taught me in the last week since I read her book. You can correct me if I'm wrong. When I'm binge streaming The Crown, I'm also possibly, probably, contaminating the drinking water of a small child in Tennessee. That the pre-distressed cotton polyurethane blend blue jeans I wear to get my organic vegetables at the farmer's market are connected to a chain that's making it harder for the fishermen at Larson's to catch the fish that go with my vegetables, which makes it harder for him to support himself, causing his children to grow up and move to the city where they stream Netflix in yoga pants, whose fibers go into the water supply and end up in the flesh of the fish I buy at Larson's in my cotton and polyurethane jeans. Am I right? Yeah, Pretty much. More or less. <laughs> uh, that eating less beef is crucial to the future of the planet, but it's not because of cow farts. It's cow burps. But it's not really cow burps. Partly cow burps. It's partly cow burps, but it's also corn. It's corn, it's corn, it's corn, corn is everywhere, and corn is evil. <laughs> so I think I've given you an idea of one of the themes of this totally fascinating, really well-written, totally accessible book. Um, and I want to give Tatiana a chance to tell us how you came to write this book and how you came to settle sort of on the themes that you settled on. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming. Um, I. So I, I started writing about climate change and the environment as a science reporter at the New York Times, and I felt like I was somebody who had always kind of been aware of climate change ever since I saw An Inconvenient Truth at the community center. Um, but I felt like even somebody like me who cares about this issue, who thinks of themselves as relatively informed, that there was so much I didn't know, and that became apparent almost immediately. Um, and it wasn't just the climate science aspect of things, but it was how all of these things work together and how we got to the point where, um, you know, wearing or producing a pair of jeans uses somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000 gallons of water. So, um, and I felt like, well, there were probably people like me who had lots of the same questions. And sometimes it felt like the conversation was either hurricanes and forest fires or utilities or a plastic bottle. 
and I, that scale didn't make sense to me. And so I want, what I wanted to do with this book was show that it's not just those things, it's, it's everything, and it's things that are sort of much more um, relatable to our everyday lives and kind of have a bigger impact than just, you know, uh, bringing my reusable bag to the grocery store and sort of how all of these things work together. And so that's what I wanted to do in this book by writing about um, the internet, food, fashion, and fuel. So one of the great things about this book is that, is that Tatiana has taken this really complicated issue and made it truly accessible for everybody in, in very clear terms. And, you know, I have to say, when I was reading it, again, I'm not sure you're going to get a lot of this out in the rest of the world, but one of the books that came to mind when I was reading it is a book that uh, Tatiana's mother wrote about the Bill of Rights called In Our Own Defense, which takes the Bill of Rights and makes it totally accessible for people. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about whether, you know, both that book, whether that book was a sort of template for you, and what other sources, what other sort of research sources you used that were really inspiring. Um, uh, I'm always inspired by my mother, but uh, not particularly <laughs> with her book about the um, Constitution. Um, but I will say that I think that that uh, that approach um, is, is definitely something that. I was thinking about because, you know, in the same way that the Constitution or the law seems inaccessible or complicated and not something that the average person can understand or be interested in, once you learn more about that or you learn more about, um, you know, uh, data centers or, um, you know, the uh, problems or air conditioning or, you know, coal ash pollution, you learn that they're actually, it is really interesting and engaging and there's a lot of different ways into this topic. And I think that, um, you know, that we tend to kind of shy away from, if we're not, we don't consider ourselves like science people, which I don't consider myself a science person, you assume that you're not going to understand um, and that it's not for you. And I think, you know, with climate change in particular, it's a story about Yes, it's about science and it's about the environment, but it's also about people and business and politics and health and injustice and inequality. And so there's something that can engage anybody. Yeah. Oh, and my sources of inspiration. Um, I So as Al said, I studied um, history for my master's. And a lot of the books that I read there um, got me really interested in environmental history. And one of them was is a book called The Mortal Sea, um, Fishing the Atlantic in the Age of Sail which is all about how sort of what the, I mean, I loved it in particular because it's about this part of the world, um, but also kind of starts out describing how each generation thinks that what it has in nature is the baseline, but that really the baseline is shifting. And so, you know, before Europeans ever came here, before the Vikings ever came here, it was the land of, I mean, the oceans were full and they described like, sailing through the ocean and you could, it was like cutting through fish. Um, and, uh, which is disgusting, but I, <laughs> um, but you know, growing up, coming to the vineyard and kind of hearing about over time how fishing, how much fishing has changed even in my lifetime um, and sort of reading the historical precedent for that was something that really drove that home um, for me that this was a topic that, you know, as a person who loves history that could really interest me as well. Um, so on the topic of food, by extension, um, I thought maybe we could, uh, I'd love for uh, Tatiana to talk to you a little bit about um, organic food and organic farming because, you know, I suspect everyone at this, under this tent probably thinks a lot about their food sources and a lot of you probably are very focused on shopping for organic food and not just for your health but for the planet. Um, but you point out some really important um, sort of misapprehensions about organic farming and misapprehensions about industrial farming as well um, and about w how we feed this big and ever-growing world we live in. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, I wanted to write about organic farming um, because I <laughs> went to this apple orchard in Connecticut that was... the best apples I've ever had, Rogers Orchards for anyone um, who's driving through Southington, Connecticut. Um, <laughs> but um, they sent me, I ordered some apples online, which I'm 
a shame to admit, but they um, <laughs> they sent me a note, you know, thanking me for my work as a reporter and saying that they weren't organic, but they were a you know eighth generation family farm committed to sustainable practices, and so I was wondering, well, why wouldn't somebody who cared about the environment be you know practice um, organic farming and because I didn't really know about it, but I assumed sort of, I think what probably many of us assume, which is that it's you know, pesticides and better water practices and better soil health and all those things. And what I learned from you know, visiting the, um, that orchard and talking to them was that um, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to grow organic apples in New England because of the mildew and the pest pressure. And so what they were trying to do was use as few pesticides as possible or use and use kind of different... Um, methods of, uh, you know, things like painting the, um, the base of the tree trunks with white paint to, um, you know, fend off dogwood boar infestation. And so all different kinds of things that aren't, wouldn't fly with a strictly organic um, certification, but, you know, also make sense and are not hurting the planet. But, um, but so then I, I wanted to learn more about it from a kind of scientific and global perspective. And organic food does offer a lot of benefits. You know, typically organic food uses a lot less water. It's better for soil health. It's better for biodiversity. But, you know, a lot of the time uh, organic farms are kind of surrounded by industrial farms that do use a lot of pesticides, so they kind of benefit from that. Um, or uh, a lot of times there are lots of pesticides that organic farms can use. Um, so. They're just sort of defined differently, or they can be found in nature, but that doesn't mean that they're healthy. Um, but the main thing was that organic food produces only about three quarters of the yield of conventional agriculture. So if everybody were to eat organically, we would have to clear cut forests and uh, farm wetlands um, and all the kinds of things that are really important carbon sinks. And so in a world, as Al said, with a population that's growing from 7 billion people now to 10 billion people by 2050 or 2100. It's not going to be possible for everybody to, for us to feed the world with organic practices because of how much land it would require. So we sort of need a balance of um, these different practices. And that was what I learned from this orchard was that, you know, it's possible to do things that are, um, you know, sustainable and um, conscious of our impacts on the environment without kind of being dogmatic about our, all of our principles. Okay. Um, Tatiana thinks that <coughs> coal ash is a really sexy topic, so I want to give her a chance to talk about coal ash. <laughs> um, you want to just go yeah. for it? Yeah, I'll go just, for I'm it. I'm going to wade right in. Um, so coal ash, um, which I had never heard of before I wrote a story about it for um, the New York Times, is the byproduct of burning coal for electricity. and. Um, Historically and today, it's often stored in ponds, which are usually like man-made or kind of bang, uh, dammed off sections of rivers and lakes. And the, um, it contains things like mercury, arsenic, lead, selenium, kind of every bad thing you can think of. And these contaminants are kind of sluiced out of um, coal plants and stored in water. Um, and often we did not have any regulation for coal ash storage until 2015, um, and they have since been uh, taken away. But um, it can leak into the groundwater. It can, um, in 2008, one of the biggest environmental disasters in American history, which I had never heard of until I started reporting on this, was a dam failed and covered 300 acres of land in Tennessee with toxic sludge. and. Um, you know, painted the, bot the river bottom with heavy metals. Um, and I couldn't believe that I had never heard of it. And it's a problem that primarily affects um, rural communities, low-income communities, uh, minority communities. And there are coal ash ponds in almost every state. There are 1,100, um, another 400 landfills. Um, and it can also be stored in landfills, which all s kind of have the same problems where the ash can blow away or it can get into the groundwater from beneath. Um, so it's a really enormous problem and it's not going away. Um, and I can't, I, I, I mean, it's, it's a horrible thing to be interested in because it's so um, disturbing and upsetting, but um, I really 
I really wanted to write about it in this book because I think it's very easy to not look at our waste, but we are actually really connected to the consequences of our consumption, and coal ash is a very good example of that because, you know, even as we move away from coal, it's usually the backup for renewable energy, um, you know, in, if, there, if it's not sunny or it's not windy or it's nighttime. Um, and so if you are doing something like watching Netflix, Netflix. or using Amazon, a lot of the um, data centers are in Virginia and Ohio. Um, and those are places that use, Virginia I think is 12% coal, Ohio is 50% coal. So you might be creating a demand for the burning of coal that you're not aware of. And as Al pointed out, that that could be, you know, contaminating somebody else's water supply. So I, I think we are all connected to these, um, these problems, whether we think about it or not, or whether it affects us directly or not. Yeah, that is a, what, another sort of terrific aspect of this book is, is this idea that we are all connected. And, uh, you know, again, preaching to the converted, I'm sure at this, under this tent, uh, we all are thinking about people other than ourselves. But I do want to, I, I want to get back to one other specific thing in the book, but because you just talked about that, I just want to jump ahead for a second and talk about privilege and about uh, environmental inequality and, uh, and the fact that, you know, everyone at this, under this tent, probably shops organic and can pay a little more for a sweater that lasts longer and uh, is, is less hard on the environment and can replace your appliances when they're not energy efficient. But that's not going to save the world. It's the rest of the planet that can't and the rest of the population that can't afford it, which you, you very clearly point out in your book. So how do we move, how do we start not moving the needle forward, but but trying to you know return us to a sustainable place when most of the world can't afford to um, act with the kind of practices that people under the table under this tent are doing. Yeah. Um, so I think, despite the fact that I wrote my entire book about the impacts of our individual stuff, I don't think that individual action alone can solve this problem. You know, it's not about whether you use a plastic bottle or a plastic straw or not, um, it's so much bigger than all of that. Um, and the real, it's not that it's wrong to try to reduce your impact or reduce your consumption because that's an important thing and it's important to, I think, live in line with your values. Um, but the real problem, the real change that has to happen is systemic change and that, I think, happens from voting, um, but also from, because, you know, Seven billion people probably aren't going to stop eating beef on their own. Those are the kind of changes that come about from, you know, regulation or market forces, which comes about from regulation often. So, you know, we can vote to, um, you know, put people in power who understand the changes that need to happen and are able to, to make them happen, and also for us to hold them accountable to do the things that are required. But we also can use um, our power as consumers and. You know, even if we can't, um, you know, control how a company uses water to produce genes, um, you know, if they're not transparent with how they're doing that or what steps they're taking to improve, you know, we don't have to buy from them. So I think those are sort of the, the major ways that um, individuals can, can make a difference, which I know is discouraging, but I think it's um, important to, to understand our role in sort of a larger context and in a global effort that, you know, isn't, it's not just about me or, you know, just about the people here. It's just about 7 billion people, so. Yeah. Um, I, I want to read, uh, I want to talk about my $89 unique low cashmere sweater for a second. And I want to read a quote from Tatiana's book that I starred because I thought it so perfectly captured the story that you're telling in this book. Okay. So. This is about the Mongolian goats that make your $89 unique low cashmere sweater. Either way, the uprooting of plants, which the goats do, uh, leaves the soil less stable and less able to retain moisture, and the goats' sharp fashion shoe hooves break up the soil and destabil destabilizing it. When the winds come, the soil, now left unrooted and not tightly packed, blows away, covering the grassland in desert, sending the dust swirling from desert to parts east. So 
you know, this idea, which I'm sure most of us don't think about, and, and, and Tatiana sort of covers a lot of different aspects of the of fast fashion and uh, the clothing industry, but the idea, which I certainly never thought about when I thought, oh, I'm gonna buy that sweater in you know every color because it's 80 bucks instead of what it used to be, that it was creating you know not only this you know clear environmental damage, but cultural, political, financial, and so maybe you can just talk a little bit about that as a sort of circle that you describe in the book. Yeah, so um, I, if anyone was at the panel yesterday, I talked a little bit about this, but um, yeah, so when Al says that the, um, the dust blows to parts, eats, it blows to Beijing where it combines with the dust from the, from the coal plants or the other factories in Beijing and can end up um, blowing across the ocean to the west coast of the United States. Um, and officials have said that they can attribute at least one additional day of air pollution in Los Angeles to dust from China. Um, and so, to me, this is a really a powerful example of how, you know, Al buying her Uniqlo sweater has an effect on the life of a goat herder in Mongolia who's more, buying more and more goats to increase his supply of cashmere that he can sell to a factory in China that's producing the cashmere sweater that's polluting the air of people in Los Angeles. And sort of what a, you know, we think that our actions are distinct and we think that, you know, we talk a lot about um, China's contribution to, to climate change um, and how bad the pollution is in China. But that pollution is, like, we're outsourcing our own emissions um, a lot of the time and our own pollution. And a lot of the manufacturing that used to take place here under stricter environmental standards now takes place in China. And so it's very easy to look at China and say, well, they really need to you know, clean it up and figure out what they're doing and stop using coal. But we have to acknowledge our own responsibility in that. Um, and I think that it's, cashmere <laughs> may seem like a very kind of inaccessible and um, elite material, w which it is and historically has been, but the kind of, um, uh, making that available to to everybody has these has profound consequences for the rest of us. Yeah. So this is the what now part of the program. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I mean, was this was writing this book just horrifying and depressing, and you wanted to stick your head in the sand? How do you push past? How did you push past that? And what was the experience like of learning all this and doing this kind of research? Um, it sucks. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it's one, one kind of redeeming fact of it was that I knew that I would soon not be alone with all of this information, um, that I would get to share it with so many wonderful people. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, I, it, it is hard and depressing and kind of, um, I think for especially, you know, people my generation and younger, you know, it's really hard to understand how we got to this point and and why this was allowed to happen um, and it you know has made me feel guilty about everything that I do and want and <laughs> like um, and that that part of it is not easy but I what I kind of came to realize from understanding the, the global context of all of this is that this is not about this is an individual guilt and individual guilt doesn't solve this problem because we were all born into a world that uses fossil fuels, but it is about collective responsibility. Um, and that was um, one thing that at least made me feel a little bit better, <laughs> was that, you know, this is a, as much as this is depressing and scary, it's also an enormous opportunity to change things. So um, I hope that other people will. <laughs> I mean, I hope I can too, but. Um, well, that answers my third question, which was to ask you to end on a hopeful <laughs> note. <laughs> um, Okay, I want to open it up to the audience. Let you guys ask some questions. Do are, are you? There's a mic over here. Come, come up. Right. Come on. Come on. Up. I'd just like to know a little bit more about not eating meat and what we do about that and what we eat instead. And if we eat fish every night, is that a new problem? And if we're eating organic every night, is that a new problem? <laughs> Um, so, uh, eating meat poses a lot of challenges. Um, you know, the production of livestock results in lots of greenhouse gas emissions from, as Al said, 
the burping. Um, and livestock in general is 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it, it is really significant. And that's not just the burping, but um, <laughs> it's a lot of other things. But um, so, you know, there, there's that problem. There's also the problem of producing the feed for the animals, which uses, um, it's more than half of crop calories um, are not used to feed people. They're used to feed animals and they're used for fuel. So the system is a lot of perverse incentives. Um, and, you know, there are also kind of ramifications for water quality from fertilizer use and runoff, um, which is sort of one of the main problems that I address in the book. Um, and, uh, you know, so, it, so that system is not set up in a way that really makes any sense. But grass-fed beef poses other problems because the cows have to live longer to eat as much grass to become fatter, so they're alive for longer, so that's more greenhouse gas emissions. So anyway, not a lot of good answers. But, um, <laughs> you know, and fish, um, actually the way to have the um, diet with the smallest uh, carbon footprint would be to eat... Um, farmed mollusks, as well as, <laughs> I mean, so uh, clams, mussels, um, scallops, uh, seaweed, um, or, and kind of a largely um, plant and grain-based diet in addition to that. But, that, I mean, that's a really hard thing to ask of people, and I love ice cream, so. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, uh, and, you know, there are um, problems with, overfishing, there are problems, I mean, the ocean is kind of a whole other um, area of problems, which I address in the book, there's a chapter about fish and oceans, but, you know, um, ocean acidification, ocean warming, um, we also, um, the most, a lot of the fish that are caught, um, like menhaden from here, or smaller fin fish um, in other parts of the world, are primarily used to create fish meal and fish oil to feed to farmed fish. So, um, or add to um, your milk or your fish oil. Um, so, so there are, um, I know that I'm not giving an answer that anyone <laughs> wants to hear or an answer at all, but um, there are kind of trade-offs for, for everything. And um, I think the kind of the best thing to do is to, you know, eat less meat. Um, I think there's a Michael Pollan quote, which is um, eat yeah. less meat, or mean mo uh, mostly vegetables, yeah. right? Anyway, I'll get it for the ne my next talk. But um, <laughs> uh, anyway, right? Yes. There you go. Eat real food, mostly plants, not too much. So that's a pretty good um, motto. So thank you, because I think you have established a blueprint of sort. And it's been less than 30 years since we've had nutri nutrition labeling. It's been probably less than 20 years since we've had energy efficient labeling on appliances. Some of us live in cities where there's now nutrition calorie counts at restaurants. And I'm just curious whether you see a course where we can have collective action and people can make smart decisions and understand the trade-offs because there's information provided that we can say, oh, this is what the footprint is, or oh, this is the water consumption. Yeah, um, I, I, I do think that, um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book was to provide the information and context in which to understand all these things. I tried really, really hard when I was at the New York Times to write a story about the carbon footprinting of food because some countries have tried to put labels on and there's some like supermarket chains in France that will um, do kind of carbon footprint of different food items and print it on the packaging. My concern about things like that is that people might not understand the meaning of those different numbers. Um, so I think the context is really important. Um, I mean, maybe just having the seal of approval will, will help people. and. You know, I hope we get to that point, but that requires, again, that's like a result of lots of different either corporate or governmental action. And so I, I think kind of having the, the voting population or the population at large, you know, be able to understand these issues and make the decisions is how we begin. I respect your commitment to the environment. I'm asking this question as... I'm asking this question with respect and as an anthropologist. And I'm going to use the example from Mongolia. 
So Mongolia, as you know, is a very um, relatively new free market democratic state, um, less than 30 years. And I'm asking about the political economy of the herders. So um, while we have to pay attention to the issues at hand, we also have to pay attention to local context. So what does it mean to say, don't buy cashmere that is, um, that is the livelihood of the herders who just recently gained their independence and are actually able to craft and negotiate their livelihood? That, at, for anthropologists who are, who are trying to complicate this narrative, so on the one hand, we, we all know the truths that you're speaking, but on the other hand, there's a local context. And whether it's Mongolia or whether it's anywhere else in the global south where um, people who have been historically marginalized are trying to carve out their economic livelihoods, we can't shut off that opportunity. Would you mind addressing that? Um, yeah, so I actually do talk about that in the book, and I didn't. Um, it's a it's very complicated context, as you know, to, to talk about everything. But it's actually the proliferation of cheap cashmere is not a system that helps herders. Um, and the collapse of the Soviet Union um, actually took away the main market for um, meat and for milk because China would uh, and Russia or the sorry the Soviet Army would buy the meat and milk for their for their soldiers, and so that market has disappeared. Um, and so there are more and more goats um, to feed our, this demand, but the quality of, I mean, it's not stable, um, and the um, the quality of because a lot there, it's really complicated. <laughs> so I, I hope that you read the book and, and I and and she does lay it out very well in the book. And it's not this is an issue that is most certainly addressed in, yeah. in several chapters yeah. in the book. Um, but I I will say that, you know, this is. There are lots of herders who are losing their lifestyle because of the um, proliferation of cheap, cheap cashmere and the growing number of goats, um, because the the quality of the fur has or the hair the yarn has declined, so they can't sell it for as much, and then their um, their herds kind of collapse or they can't make enough money from it anymore. So that is definitely a major concern. It's not something that I gloss over, and I don't think, you know, I. I I would never say that the environmental angle is more important than the human angle, but I think that the sustainable options usually intersect. Um, and so, um, and uh, you know, I, I don't think that anybody should be left behind, but I also don't think that the fast fashion market was really helpful to any of those people. Well, thanks for your book. I think it's really important, but it highlights um, to me, you know, how incredibly complex this problem is. It seems like more than half of the environmental projects out there or movements are almost greenwashing <laughs> because they have unintended consequences. So I'm involved uh, as chair of a group called Project Drawdown, which uh, maybe you know about. It's in the book. Um, right. And, uh, you know, we're focused on market-based solutions. <clears throat> and the good news is big companies are moving faster uh, than a lot of people expected because their consumers, their customers, and their employees want them to. But governments are moving very slowly. And you pointed out, ultimately, it's going to take government <clears throat> regulation and action. So I was at a climate conference recently, and the dinner afterwards, with private dinner off the record, I was shocked <clears throat> to find that a lot of the leading people in the climate movement, if you will, uh, who are pretty moderate people, were talking about the need for civil disobedience <laughs> at this point to really tip, be a tipping point. And that really surprised me, um, but it was an interesting discussion. What do you think is going to be the tipping point, and do you think it, we need to get to civil disobedience to accelerate our, our governments to move? Um, well, I think we have seen a lot more yeah. of that action in the last year with the, the Sunrise Movement, um, which is sort of the, the um, you know, protest arm of the of New Consensus, which wrote the Green New Deal. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm not sure that. Um, I mean, I, I think that we will have to demand a lot more in whatever form that takes, if that's civil disobedience. And I think you know the the uh, the school strikes that are happening all over the world, or Extinction Rebellion in London. I think is, you know, those protests 
at least in part, inspired the government of uh, the UK to declare a climate emergency. And that may not be meaningful right now, but I think so far that's, I think, what is creating the most direct action. So I wish that that's not how it had to happen and that we had people in government who understood what needed to happen and that, you know, market forces moved even faster, but um, it seems like it is going to have to take the action of a lot of individuals in the kind of collective political space to make that happen. But I don't, I don't know. Um, that's a little shorter than I am. <laughs> okay. I was interested in your comments about organic because um, my understanding is one of the other issues with organic is it's still grown more, more or less as a monocrop. And so I'm wondering, I haven't read your book yet, I'm wondering, do you address in there or, or encourage ways to support regenerative agriculture? Because I think that's a way that we can actually grow organic and feed the world, and it is also a way that you can take that understanding to places where they are, for example, goat herding and create fertile soil as opposed to dry soil. So I wonder if you've given that any thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, in the, I know in the book there is you know a lot about how we need different lots of different approaches and um, you know preserving soil health is important for lots of reasons not only for food production but also for carbon sequestration um, and so I, you know I think we should be trying lots of different things I do also you know I'm not somebody I'm not a purist on on any of this stuff and I I don't personally think that. Um, <coughs> we can overlook the advances of the Green Revolution if we're trying to feed billions, billions more people. But I, I do think that there's room for, for regenerative agriculture and you know, organics and you know, some of the practices of industrial farming, but it will take a lot of um, you know, reimagining and reconstruction of our food system so that the incentives are more aligned with actually feeding people. I just want to say thank you. I'm a high school teacher at a public high school in rural Vermont. Uh, it's a poor rural Vermont uh, high school. We have 600 kids in our school. Um, this is real to those local farmers. Um, but what we have is a very active environmental club in my high school. So if you're looking for an action item for civil disobedience, maybe call your local school board and see if they have an environmental club. And if you're so inclined, maybe you want to buy a series of these books and yes, donate them do to that. your local high school so that they can actually be informed. I actually want to say that... That when, after I read the book, and having written a book on uh, activism for teenagers, and sitting down for a conversation with Tatiana, the first thing I said to her is, this book belongs in every high school. It really is a, it's, because it gets at, I mean, the next generation, in my opinion, is, you know, if anyone's going to save us, it is them. And they're, they're on it. They're and what? They're paying attention, they care, they're passionate, they're out there, they are practicing civil disobedience. And this book has the capacity to, not so much on a, you know, on a, it, it's not a call to action so much as it is a, do you know what this, you know, what it took to make this? Uh, and that will change their behavior in fundamental ways. So I recommend that everybody who has a relationship with a high school, has teenagers, knows teenagers, go home, get Tatiana's book, and then go home and tell your local high school to put it in their curriculum, because it really is a, a superb book. Hi, thank you. Um, making it so accessible to people is really the way to do this, and I think the high school connection is great. My question is around China and some of the countries in Africa who are basically saying, you Americans, um, it's our turn to live a middle class life. And that's a reasonable assumption. We want to drink and eat and pollute, and you guys did it, and why are you cutting it off? And you're pulling up the drawbridge now. How would you counter that? And is it time for some kind of international education movement before more harm will be done in those countries? Um, it's a really complicated question, and I think one that has plagued the environmental, the kind of global um, environmental movement for a long time, which is, you know, it does feel like a 21st century imperialism to say, well, I already have my air conditioner, but now you can't have one, um, especially when you're living in a place that's much hotter and more humid than where I live. Um, so, you know, 
I I don't know how we, we do how we get around that those issues. Um, you know, I think we have some examples like um, you know the the Montreal Protocol, um, which uh, eliminated chlorofluorocarbons from um, air conditioning and refrigerators and styrofoam and, you know, gave a, a grace period to some of these other countries to adjust their technologies at a more reasonable pace. And they're doing that again with current air conditioning chemicals, just as an example. But, you know, I, I think that uh, we don't have a lot of time, so it, it's hard to, um, you know, to figure out how, how we allow for those developments. Um, but I... But I also, you know, wonder and hope if maybe there's a way for some of these countries to leapfrog over coal and go straight to, um, you know, a sort of more renewable or um, kind of less impactful electricity generation system. But I think, you know, there are other ways that um, this can happen, things like better city planning so people live and work in the same place and don't need to drive to work, um, you know, better water management, all these kinds of things, you know, have impacts. and that requires global investment and not just from China. And it also relies on us voting uh, for men and women who will make it possible for us to make a better and not a worse world. And on that note, we are done. Thank you so much, Tatiana. I should say also, um, my book isn't out yet. <laughs> um, it comes out August 27th, but you can pre-order it um, here or online. Or if you Google, if you go to my website, tatianaschlossberg.com, um, you can find all the information. So, but thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>